Hey guys, it's Ed, Doc Brown Bud here. Today I'm going to take a look at what the future holds for running shoes in 2022. Thanks for tuning in guys, it's always appreciated. If you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button and click the bell below for notifications when I launch those new videos for you. And it helps the channel out a huge amount if you give this video a thumbs up like. Over the last few years, I think you will all agree we've seen huge leaps in terms of running shoe technology. The world of running has been turned on its head, really. Lighter, faster, more propulsive, less fatiguing foams. All these things have entered the fray and now even like a 300 gram shoe is seen as being like a brick, just way too heavy, which is crazy really. Rule books have been rewritten and price tags inflated. The question is, with every manufacturer copying that same template of super cushioned foam, carbon plate designs and big price tags, to quote Radiohead's The Benz, where do we go from here? From Asics to Mizuno, Puma to Adidas, every single running brand has now got a flagship carbon plate shoe with very responsive high stacked foam cushion under the foot and some type of carbon rigidity element. It's become commonplace for shoes to be upwards of 200 earth credits UK now. And the top most desired shoes are just really hard to come by at times. I mean, I really fancy the Puma Deviate Nitro Elite, but yeah. It seems as if they only made about three of them. Where once the Nike Zoomfly Flyknit was seen as being high tech, now it just seems old hat. There's far more forgiving foams out there which are allowing runners to increase their mileage to unprecedented levels at times with very minimal payback. You know what I mean. No one's getting injured, or are they? So where on earth do we go from this point? If we look back to the 70s, for example, some of the top models there were selling for about $20. So I guess in today's money, that's about $100. So there's an unprecedented increase, really, when you look at it from that perspective. So top level shoes are now, what, a couple of times more expensive than that? Maybe even three? Doesn't really leave an awful lot of room for maneuver, does it? Or on just have one pair of running shoes now, there's a rotation, there's one for every single different discipline, different type of run. I mean, Nike charged 270 Earth credits over here in the UK for their AlphaFly model. Even the Tempo Next Percent is an eye-watering 180 Earth credits. Both shoes I scored down in terms of value when I reviewed them due to this. They're stupendously expensive really when you consider that athletes have produced some incredible times on the track in the more meager, I suppose, Dragonfly Spike. Yes, I know it's got a Zoom X foam in it, but there's nowhere near as much stack height. That one's about 135 Earth credits, so well, it puts it into perspective really, doesn't it? I mean, the Alpha Fly and the Tempo Next Percent are in the upper echelon of stack height, aren't they? I think there's 39 millimeters in the Alpha Fly, 40 millimeters in the Tempo Next Percent men's version. Someone mentioned that there was 42 millimeters in the women's one. I'm not entirely sure if that is the case. I think the Next Percent has 40 millimeters. They're all right up there though, aren't they? Right at the max, max cushion, but they're not max cushion because they're racing shoes. Are they all seem colossal when you compare them up against Asics Metaspeed Sky. That's apparently got 33 millimeters in the heel, so quite a bit less. Almost the same as the original Vapor 5 4% model. That had 31 in the heel, 21 in the forefoot. Some still swear by that model being the ultimate version of the Vaporfly produced at this point. So with those stack height rules in place, manufacturers can't increase that anymore, so what happens next? Of course, we've seen Adidas prune the upper on their Adios Pro model. On the Adios Pro 2, it's quite a bit less upper. It's a lot thinner, more flexible. We saw a precursor to that really in the Takumi Sen 7. The material that they've used here on the Sen 7's upper is very similar to that in the Adios Pro 2. Thinner mesh, less material, and overall a more breathable upper. I don't think they can take away much more material from the upper without losing that all important lockdown from across the top and around the midfoot. I think weight is the thing to lose here, guys. They've got these maximally cushioned stacks now, but everyone wants them to be as light as possible. I was surprised though to see the opposite approach from New Balance recently with the RC Elite 2. The RC Elite 2 actually gained weight over the first version of the shoe. I see the second version of the RC Elite to have a more wide ranging appeal to a bigger cross section of runners just a more comfortable and plush upper than we saw in the first version of the shoe. Maybe New Balance felt the RC Elite was just a little bit too niche. Perhaps that affected sales. It 
perhaps marginalised people a little bit. They thought that they weren't quite good enough for it. I always thought the original version of the RC Elite was a little closer to the Vaporfly 4% in terms of its midsole stack, the upper, just the general aggressive feel of the shoe. Pretty much had the same drop and that same aggressive plate feel. You get the feeling that the first super shoes produced by brands like Brooks, Scott, New Balance perhaps, were all attempts at making a clone really of the Vaporfly 4%, a carbon plate shoe trying to mirror the success and innovation of that shoe. But the sequels have been seemingly more like the Alpha Fly with a far less aggressive drop. I have to say the Alpha Fly and the Tempo Next Percent feel nothing like any other shoe that I've tried. And I think the Tempo Next Percent really does stand out on its own. I think Nike are onto something with that one, let's hope they don't drop it. In training I produce some insane times in that shoe. And aside from price at retail, I can't help but advise you to try it out. Adidas for a period had avoided pumping up the prices of their top flagship shoes. Well, sadly that seems to have ended now. I did notice there's a new colorway of the Prime X available. I was very tempted to pick it up, you know, I like to try things out, but do I really need all of that stack? And the answer is probably no. I mean, today I was running in the Rincon 3 and that does the job. Do I need loads and loads of millimeters of stack? Over 50 millimeters. Is it necessary? Maybe if I was gonna do some like 20 mile long run or something, perhaps, but I don't do that all that often. Adidas have blown through two barriers there, haven't they? Over 200 pounds and over 50 millimeters in stack height, at least in my size anyway. Just put it into perspective, 220 pounds for a shoe that doesn't adhere to championship world athletics rules. So effectively, yeah, you can't really wear it in a championship race, so it's going to be a maximally cushioned training shoe for you. That's a lot of money. Is it aimed at amateur runners? Is it a training product? I wonder how people felt when Nike released shoes with those airbags in the midsoles. I wonder if it was the same type of feel that people had. The same type of anxieties and questions. I do remember reading that some runners just wouldn't touch them because they thought the airbags would burst and they'd pop, you know, mid-run. Not sure that's happened all that often. Aside from with those air zoom pods that are in the front of the Tempo Next Percent and the Alpha Fly. So with Adidas breaking down that barrier, will that lead to other manufacturers now producing even higher, taller shoes? Are they all going to ditch the stack height limit and just ignore those World Athletics regulations? Will we see a £300 plus running shoe from Nike perhaps that even trumps the Prime X in terms of midsole stack? Perhaps 50 millimeters of stack with Zoom X instead of Light Strike Pro and additional plates and air units as well. I have a nasty feeling that we will actually because we've already seen Nike fooling around with some of that tech in some of their casual shoes. We've seen processed and recycled Zoom X rather than the standard stuff. So it's bound to happen sooner or later. Asics and Saucony seem reluctant to enter into this war, don't they, at the moment? They seem to be going for more reasonably stacked and traditional running shoe models right now, at least for the time being. We'll see if that stays the same as we move towards the end of 2021. Even Hoka have been experimenting, haven't they, with their Bondi model, adding even more stack and a carbon plate. And the price is only going one way. It's odd to find so many people enjoying the more minimal Zoom X stack on that Dragonfly track spike. Quite a lot of people opted for that one, rather than the other models that had those air zoom pockets in the front. Do you think 2022's models will be even more expensive with even higher midsole stacks? Is there even any extra benefit to having all this extra foam underfoot? Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one down in the comments. A quick musical interlude for you. I'm not sure what's happened to them, but the Webb brothers just seem to have disappeared off the face of the earth. They did some great albums, and one of those was back in 2003. It was simply titled The Webb Brothers. I love the first track on this album. Absolutely amazing. It just builds up from nothing to this sort of huge, magical, mysterious number called The World Is Big. It's kind of talking about how the world seems huge when you're like a young child. There's all this wonderment to it. And then as you sort of grow older, the world seems very, very small. And it sort of closes in a little bit on you. Or at least it can, if you let it. There's a nice mixture here between sort of more open drummed beats and also drum machine style rhythms as well. I do like the track Miss Moriarty and also the track The Chill. The Webb Brothers are the two sons of Jimmy Webb, the famous writer and producer. I believe he wrote MacArthur Park. So you probably know that one. Go and check it out anyway, guys. Very interesting music to consume that you may never have heard of. The Webb Brothers, bye.
the Wad Brothers. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video today, guys. It's always appreciated. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button and click the bell below for notifications of when I roll them out for you. And it really does help the channel out if you give this video a thumbs up like, but also share this video with your running buddies. My name's Ed Bud, and I'll be seeing you.